origami, the traditional Japanese art of creating objects by folding paper. From children to the elderly, origami is enjoyed by people of all ages. With roots in religious rituals and social etiquette, it expresses many facets of Japanese culture. Origami techniques have even been used in space. And recently, an alternative to 3D printing that uses origami has been developed. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is origami. We'll see why the art of folding paper has long had such a special place in Japanese hearts. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in the neighborhood of Yushima, which is in central Tokyo in an area that has a lot of schools and colleges and cultural facilities. And I'm standing in front of a place called the Origami Center. It's a six-story building that has exhibition spaces, classrooms, and as you can see, a little shop here in the entrance. This kimono here is made entirely of paper, although that's not origami. I don't think I've ever seen a single sheet of paper big enough to fold something like that. But these little paper windmills down here and these morning glories here are all made using origami technique. Now, of course, Japan is by no means the only country in the world where people make things out of paper. But the fact that the word origami is so well known around the world is an indication of how famous this paper folding art has become. So let's start off with a look at what it's all about. A classic pastime that practically everyone in Japan has enjoyed at some point, origami is the art of folding paper into countless different shapes. A crane with wings spread wide. A frog in the water. Flowers like the iris and the lotus. Even a samurai helmet. In origami, all these items and more are made without scissors or paste, just single sheets of paper folded in various ways to create three-dimensional objects. Paper for origami is usually square and colored. The paper itself is also referred to as origami. Origami paper is widely sold in Japanese stationery and toy shops in a vast range of patterns, from traditional motifs to modern Western ones, with matte or glossy finishes. Bookshops have whole shelves dedicated to books about origami. These teach you how to make all sorts of forms, from the very simple to the extremely complex. Origami is popular among children, of course, but plenty of grown-ups enjoy it as well. From intricate patterns incorporating paper cranes to items that combine various coloured sheets of paper to highly realistic models of animals. There's no limit to the sophistication of origami creations. Some origami works are as good as sculptures, like this one depicting a falling cat. Here's another unique piece. It appears to be a potted tree, about as tall as a person. But take a closer look. Its flowers are tiny origami cranes. Each one is just eight millimeters tall. More than 10,000 cranes were folded from squares of paper 18 millimeters on a side to create this piece, which is called Crane Tree. It was the art school graduation project of Naoki Onogawa. It took him four months, during which he folded cranes for 10 hours a day. Origami can be used to make items that are functional as well as beautiful. But either way, it's long been part of everyday life in Japan. And my guest on the program today is actually the director of the Origami Center, Mr. Kazuo Kobayashi. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for being with us today. I'm glad to be here. 
お世話になります。Kazuo Kobayashi is actively engaged in the daily running of the center. He not only teaches classes, he often offers origami demonstrations to people visiting the center shop. He is also the director of a non profit called the International Origami Center. Kobayashi is constantly involved in promoting origami around Japan and across the globe. Although he only speaks Japanese, he uses origami as a universal language to reach people of all cultures. Here's something I can make with a single sheet of paper. Women love this wherever I go in the world. No words needed. I've got no idea what this is going to be. And this always slays them wherever you go. That's right. From orphanages to senior citizen homes, at all kinds of places, it captivates people. Their eyes always light up at this one. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Not bad, eh? Inside the Origami Center is this paper dyeing workshop. Kobayashi is in fact the fourth generation heir of a family that's been making hand dyed Japanese paper in the heart of Tokyo for more than 150 years. I'm told that your company was the first one ever to produce these perfectly square pieces of paper for making origami. When was that? This was in 1885. That's when it started. We were supplying schools with paper. Not shops, mind. This is where origami for educational use was born. In the late 19th century, origami started to be used in kindergartens and primary schools in Japan. How has origami developed over the centuries? Let's start at the beginning and look at the history of paper in Japan. The Chinese tradition of papermaking was transmitted to Japan in the 7th century. At that time, white paper was revered as sacred and used in making decorations for Shinto shrines and ritual implements. For the Japanese, paper was used not only to write and paint on, it also provided a sacred medium for wishes and prayers. After the age of the samurai dawned, a new system of etiquette evolved in which it became customary to wrap gifts in paper using formal techniques. Depending on the item, the season, and the occasion, a wedding or funeral, for example, different ways to wrap gifts were specified. In the 18th century, formal paper wrapping spread to the public at large. People were intrigued by the folded motifs used in wrapping and eventually began to enjoy the folding of cranes, butterflies, and so on in its own right. That was the origin of today's art of origami. Origami books were published explaining complex folds like the ones seen in these illustrations. Advanced paper folding techniques developed. By the late 19th century, origami lessons became part of the curriculum at kindergartens and primary schools. Although origami was no longer mandatory in schools after the Second World War, its popularity as a fun pastime has remained to the present day. Of course, there are other countries around the world that people fold paper into various objects. But why do you think it is that in Japan the art of folding paper, origami, has developed as far as it has? It's really because of the quality of the paper. Japan had thin paper. Paper making came from China, but that was paper meant for writing. Which was quite thick. In Japan, we came up with strong but thin paper using a technique of sloshing pulp over mesh screens. 
Liquid containing the pulp of plants, the raw material, is sieved through a screen. This deposits pulp fibers that are tightly interlocked, making the paper strong. It's a made in Japan technique that creates a unique kind of thin paper. Thin, strong paper became available. That made origami possible. So because the, the paper was thin and tough, it was easy to fold and it didn't tear. I get it. Another factor is the Japanese custom of folding things. For example, the kimono I'm wearing. When you're not wearing it, a kimono isn't hung, it's folded. That's why you get these creases on the kimono. They form part of the beauty. Folding is important in Japanese culture, so it was natural to fold paper too. There is another reason that origami developed in Japan. There's also a wrapping tradition. For example, you present gifts of money wrapped in paper. When receiving a gift wrapped in paper, in other countries, people just tear it off. They're excited. But in Japan, we never do that. I can, I can remember sometimes taking a gift to somebody back in England, and you give it to them, and it's been wrapped in a Japanese shop, and they, they don't want to open it because it just looks so beautiful. Oh, really? <laughs> nice wrapping shows that you're thinking of the recipient. If you fold things carefully, you put heart and soul into the task. Origami can be a useful way to show that you care. When you think of origami, overwhelmingly, the image that immediately comes to mind is that of the crane. So many thousands and probably millions of people fold cranes. Why this obsession with cranes? The crane is associated with good fortune and longevity. In legend, cranes live for a thousand years. And there was an old custom. You would eat crane every January the 16th. Really? Well, the shogun would eat crane. It represented a wish for a good year. But most people didn't actually get to eat it, so they made do by folding a paper crane. Origami cranes came to represent the same wish. People often make paper cranes in sets of a thousand, which they take to someone who is sick. The recipient is delighted because it's easy to see how much time and effort went into making something intended for their benefit. In Japan, people wishing for someone to recover from illness or do well in an important exam often make a large number of origami cranes. The story of one girl made this custom of folding cranes famous around the world. At the age of two, Sadako Sasaki was a victim of the Hiroshima atomic bombing. At nine, she was diagnosed with leukemia. Her passion for life prompted her to fold 1,000 paper cranes. Tragically, she died after eight months in hospital. A statue of her was later erected as a memorial to the children who perished due to the atomic bombings. Books about Sadako's story have been published in numerous countries, reminding readers about the tragedy of war. To this day, people the world over fold origami cranes and send them to Hiroshima to convey a wish for world peace. I'm Matt Alt, and we're in one of my favorite places in the city, an izakaya a drinking spot where you can enjoy small plates of lots of different Japanese foods and sake. Now you may be wondering, what's an izakaya have to do with origami? Here's your towel, sir. Why, thank you. At izakaya, they always start with a little towel like this to wash your hands. It's called an oshibori. And today, 
I'm going to try folding one of these into origami. Though origami actually means folded paper, and this is cloth, so I guess you'd call it orinuno. Hello. Thank you for coming. Today, Mr. Sasagawa is going to school me in the art of towel folding. He's a master of the craft. So, is this all of your stuff? Yes, I made all of them. This looks like a little bunny rabbit. And this one's a chick. I guess this one's a penguin. This is a strawberry. And this looks like a pair of rice balls. And finally, is this a little baby? This is so cute. So in a word, what's the appeal of folding things out of Oshibori? Unlike paper, you can fold and refold a towel lots of times. Also, you get them at every izakaya, so you can just take one and entertain your friends. All right, a good trick for the dinner table, I see. Well, on that note, I've absolutely fallen in love with this little chick, and I'm kind of hoping you can teach me how to make it. Of course. Let's do it. <laughs> First, lay down the towel with a corner facing you and then fold it like this. Like this. There's a trick to this step. Don't line up the two corners. Have the top one a little lower. I see, so a little bit low, okay. Now roll it away from you. Okay, so roll it. As you roll it, the corner that you left lower will start to shift. It should line up perfectly. Okay. Now grasp the middle and fold it down like this. And there's a trick here. One side should be a little longer than the other. It should be longer by about the width of two fingers. Okay. Now this part is askew, so straighten it out. This will be the beak. Now take the short end. Take the short end and bunch it up at the back in a W shape. A W like this. Now wrap the long end around horizontally. Okay. Like this. Just the direction? Wrap it around toward you. Ah, okay. Tuck the end into this fold. There. Okay. Now open up the beak a little bit. And we have a chick. <laughs> Mine looks more like a duck. Oh, the beak is a bit too long. Well, of course, you're the master, so it's only natural yours looks better. But it's cute. This is really cute. It's fun for people of all ages, from children to office workers. It's not all that hard to practice. So next time you come to an izakaya, pick up your towel and give it a try yourself. See you next time. Kiss, kiss. We have all these objects on the table here that sort of look like origami, but then I'm not quite sure. What are these? These are folded notes, the kind that schoolgirls are always passing around in class. OK, very cute. So you open one up like this. OK. <laughs> See how it works? It's a charming way to exchange handwritten notes. Here's a love letter. OK, that's fairly obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Inside, it probably says, I love you. Uh. I kind of like the idea that it's useful in addition to being decorative. Absolutely. You can use any old paper lying about. This kind of rectangular paper, your average page from a newspaper, for example, or magazine. Fold it like this. Now open it up. It's a box. So exactly. <laughs> you know, in the winter, when people are sitting around eating tangerines, I've noticed people, they have these little paper boxes and they, 
take the skin off the tangerine and they, they, they put it in here instead of having to look around for a waste paper bin. So yes, we use origami like that. It's fun and handy. Japan's origami culture shows up in all kinds of products used in everyday life. One example is cardboard packaging. Folded by hand from a single sheet of flat cardboard with no staples or adhesive, origami-like packaging holds things snugly and securely. This packaging is for safely shipping bottles of wine. Some cardboard packaging can be very complex. This here is used to store precision machinery, but it's still a single folded sheet of cardboard. Whereas origami is an art and beauty is the goal, cardboard packing is about functionality. Each technique developed to achieve a different objective. Yet ultimately, they both result in three-dimensional shapes produced from a single flat piece. They both have the same appeal, that same element of creative excitement and surprise. One origami technique comes in very handy for things like maps. It's called the Muda fold. It allows a folded sheet to be expanded to full size in a single motion and folded back up just as easily. The Muda fold is made with the creases slightly offset rather than exactly overlapping. Koryo Muda, a professor at the University of Tokyo, came up with the idea and unveiled it in 1980. The Muda fold has even found applications in space. It was used for the folding solar panels of a satellite. The panels, about six meters on a side, open and fold in one motion. This design has been successfully tested in orbit. Origami techniques have already found so many practical applications, but researchers are seeking more. This laboratory at Meiji University is focused on what it calls origami engineering. But what exactly is that? We do research on commercial applications of origami. Making certain components of a car chassis with origami-like creases helps them to absorb the force of impact in collisions. Here's a hat that folds up small, making it easy to carry in a handbag. This diagram shows industrial robots that have been programmed to fold sheets of material. These are just a few examples of the lab's origami engineering research. In 2014, it announced it had developed origami-based 3D printing. The heart of the system is a piece of software that analyzes the 3D data of an object and automatically generates 2D papercraft schematics. These schematics can be printed out on an ordinary printer. Then, by folding the schematics along the printed fold lines, the 3D object can be assembled. These days, all sorts of potential is being seen in 3D printers, which can construct objects by depositing special resins or powders. The system developed in the Meiji University Laboratory allows 3D shapes to be constructed from hand-folded paper instead. All you need is an ordinary home printer and ordinary paper. And you can create a 3D object. Anyone can do it. And it's extremely affordable. Professor Hagiwara hopes this system will make it easy for people like product engineers and design students to create 3D prototypes. His laboratory continues to explore engineering applications for origami. You often see Japanese children doing origami, and even when I was a child back in London, I don't know if I knew the word origami, but we used to do kind of paper folding and stuff. And when you get it right, 
there's a real satisfaction about it's like when you've solved a puzzle or something it, it looks good and there's this great satisfaction as well you're right. Origami is an excellent form of education for children. It teaches them not to rush and to listen. They learn to take things step by step. Using your fingers also stimulates the brain. We say feet are like a second heart and hands are like a second brain. If it's small enough, fold origami holding it up in your hands. Keep the paper in your hands, you don't put it down on the table. Right. That way you're constantly touching it. It's great for the elderly. Moving fingers like this is a common rehabilitation exercise. They stimulate the brain. Anti-aging. Exactly. But if you're just doing these movements for an hour, you get bored. With origami, you get the pleasure of making something, a sense of satisfaction. And you can give what you've made to someone. I believe origami will go on spreading all over the world. Everywhere in the world you have paper. Origami can be done anytime, anywhere, with no tools. That's why it's so wonderful. You know, these days in the world, everything is becoming digital. And it's very convenient and everything. And obviously, I use a computer every day as well. But I sometimes think about, you know, how we don't really do things with our bodies anymore. We do a lot of thinking with our brains. But if it keeps on going the way it's going, I think we're all going to lose the ability to do things just through lack of practice. And listening to what you've said today, I think it might be a great idea if we all carry around a little pack of square bits of paper with us and then if we have five or ten free minutes in the middle of the day we just fiddle with them and get some practice of moving our fingers and using our brains for other things than writing email um, and maybe it would make us all a little bit happier and better off worth a try anyway thank you very much thank you Next time, Buddhist statues, objects of prayer and works of art. We'll see how a Japanese devotion to wood and natural beauty has influenced the evolution of these treasured icons.